Today's gospel, we hear our Lord explaining one of the parables found in Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the weeds. The object of the parable is not only to insist on what Jesus says in many places in the gospel, that again, there will be two eternal rewards. There will either be heaven or hell. And that part of humanity will go to heaven and the other part will go to hell. Our Lord is very clear about that. But the parable also wants to highlight God's tolerance of evil, his patience. Proverbs 14, 16 says, a man of quick temper acts foolishly, but a man of discretion is patient. St. Paul actually puts patience at the head of the list as far as the qualities of love are concerned. He says, love is patient and kind, 1 Corinthians 13, 4. So not only is God perfect love, but he's more patient than anyone else as well. The apostle Peter says in 2 Peter 3, 9, he said that the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Patience, however, doesn't mean that God doesn't or uh, won't take action. It means that he delays punishment, but it doesn't mean that he dismisses it altogether. No, for now, the Lord allows the wheat, he allows his children to grow alongside the tares, who are the devil's children, as Jesus says in Matthew 13, 38. So just because our Lord allows the wheat and the weeds to grow side by side, however, doesn't mean that the church shouldn't correct and even punish Catholics that are behaving badly. The church has never understood that par this parable in that way. Now, the church has the right and the duty to censure and admonish and even exclude those who cause scandal. That includes people who teach errors, but it also includes those who wound and damage the unity of the church. The church admonishes and corrects these problem children either through excommunication or through other what are called canonical penalties. For example, taking away the faculties of a priest to do their exercise their ministry or censoring them or someone else or removing them from positions of governing authority or other things. And the church does this, why? One, to correct those who are obstinate in their errors, but also two, to protect the faithful from those errors and from those bad shepherds, as it were. It's true that the church is slow and even at times reluctant to correct error and heresy these days. I know that from experience, uh, going to the pontifical universities in Rome, heresy is taught by a number of professors there. It's a sad reality, but even though that's the case, the answer to heresy and to what are called the modernist errors, the answer isn't to go to the other extreme of traditionalism, which in the end embraces the same errors as the modernists. The errors that both modernists and traditionalists embrace are one, lack of faith in the church, which is essentially two, a lack of faith in the guidance of the Holy Spirit in the church. So it's essentially a lack of trust in God coupled with, three, a misplaced trust in their own personal private judgments. So they don't really trust the church on the one hand, but on the other hand, they trust their own opinions and the interpretations and the opinions of others who aren't trustworthy, which can be for a lack of humility, but at root, five, there's always a lack of charity in all of this. So the two extremes, in that, in that sense, the two extremes do finish in the same errors. And to put it in even simpler terms, you know, a traditionalist priest, so meaning one that doesn't have canonical status and aren't in full communion with the church, you know, a traditionalist priest is just as bad as a modernist priest, perhaps even worse. Why? Because the traditionalist priest can have the aura of sanctity so they can easily fool some of the devout. They have the external signs of sanctity, perhaps even the aura of sanctity, but they lack the substance of sanctity, which is found in what? In humility, in obedience, in charity, in full unity with the Catholic Church. 
And any priest who celebrates mass and other sacraments without faculties, meaning without church permission, that priest lives in habitual mortal sin. Uh, so that's not someone who you want to entrust yourselves or your families to. And regarding the wheat and the tares and church discipline, you know, even if the church censors and someone or it removes them from positions of authority unjustly and on false grounds, I mean, that does happen sometimes, you know, what's the correct response to that? The correct response is humble obedience and submission to the church. That's the safest path, and it's the path that our Lord himself walked during his earthly light in life in the sense that St. Paul says that Jesus, quote, humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross, Philippians 2.8. Justice is always a good thing to work and to strive for, but a true follower of Christ knows that they will also have to learn to embrace injustices at times. Why? Because Jesus did. So I'm going to have to learn to do it as well. So in our spiritual life, we're call to imitate the character and the virtues of Christ, Christ who humbles himself, who accepts injustices and offers them as prayers to his heavenly Father. For what? For our conversion, for our sanctification, for our salvation, and for others too. And also we're called to imitate Christ who is patient with the wayward, with those who stray, and even with troublemakers, even with bad shepherds and with unruly sheep practical piece of advice we always give regarding these things is that we need to also pray, obviously, to our Lord and to Our Lady and ask them to help us have a heart of mercy towards those who, whom we perceive to be more tares than wheat. Uh, we, we may even be wrong in our judgments at times because only God knows the hearts of everyone. But at times we want to try, at all times, we want to try to have a heart of mercy towards others and Pray for them and do good for them. Why? Because our Lord says, But I say to you that here, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, said our Lord. Luke 6, 27 through 28. Perhaps these tares, perhaps these bad sheep and, and or bad shepherds had a bad formation or they had other family or personal difficulties that we aren't aware of, or they might even have mental and psychological problems. You know, on a personal level, a good thing to do is try to make excuses for others, in a sense that try to excuse them for their errors, saying with our Lord on the cross, you know, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, Luke 23, 34, that's typically what our position should be, since we're not usually in the position of addressing and correcting these problems. So interiorly, and probably often in our conversations with others, I think we want to try to do that. We want to try to make excuses for those who behave badly. Why do we want to do that? Well, because that's often what we do with ourselves, isn't it? Isn't that what I do when I do something wrong? I've often got an excuse or a reason for why I do something wrong, even things I shouldn't do or things that aren't uh, edifying or charitable. So if I make excuses for me, shouldn't I try to do the same thing towards others? Jesus said, whatever you wish others would do to you, do so to them, for this is the law and the prophets, Matthew 7, 12. So we pray for them and do good to them and remember the day of perfect justice will come. So we have to be patient. That day will come when the wheat and the tares are separated. And as Bishop Sheen, I think, once said, he said, uh, on that day there will be surprises, too. There will be surprises. So let's ask Our Lady, our Lord's most faithful gardener, let's ask her for the grace to grow in spiritual strength and maturity amidst the weeds and the tares of this world. Praise be Jesus and Mary. Now and forever.